Hi guys and welcome to Quick Guides for Medicine, short videos designed to help you get your mind around things you need to know for internal medicine and today we're talking about cardiology. Um, before we start with the specific diagnosis, let's go over some of the main topic categories we need to know for cardiology. I would typically start, it's almost impossible uh, not to start with um, acute coronary syndrome for example, uh, we can group them under ischemic ischemic heart diseases all right um so that's one category so we're basically just gonna go uh do sort of like a mind map thing around here um next category we can talk about uh heart failure all right all right uh we'll eventually go a little bit in depth obviously uh with the several categories of those and then we can go ahead and talk about cardio myopathies cardiomyopathies and then we can go further and um, talk about specific diagnosis um, you know simple diagnosis such as syncope for example all right syncope syncope a lot of times is multi multifactorial uh, but one of the main causes of syncope uh, something you have to rule out will be arrhythmias obviously so we can talk about um, arrhythmias whether it's you know tachyarrhythmias or um, radiarrhythmias um, will eventually go further and talk about the different categories under that. Um, we can then further talk about pericardial diseases, for example. Pericardial diseases, all right? We should be able to group all of those um, under that category as well and we further exp uh, expantiate. Next, we can talk about valvular diseases valvulopathies oh lord that's the big one valvulopathies all right we talk about that as well it's a huge huge one um okay uh what else can we talk about uh we can then go ahead and talk about congenital heart diseases congenital heart diseases and then further talk about aortic diseases um, obviously these are just broad categories if we were to go further you know into uh, ischemic heart diseases for example will be you know further different let's use another color just so it makes it a bit more you know less monotonous um, we'll go here and talk about chronic chronic stable angina uh, and guys, you can tell me what you prefer, you know, whether it's the blue color or the red color or some other color that makes it uh, more obvious. You can put your comments in the um, comment section. So I said chronic stable angina is one category of ischemic heart diseases. Uh, we can then uh, further talk about acute coronary syndromes. All right. Uh, I kind of, you know, sort of group them in, you know, small um, in categories depending on the hierarchy of acuity here, obviously, um, uh, most stable angina will be, won't be something you have to rush to the hospital for, uh, acute coronary syndromes, on the other hand, you definitely have to be in the emergency room to get evaluated. Um, moving forward, uh, with heart failure, two main categories of uh, heart failure, we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction all right and then we also have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction it's it's surprising that sometimes when you're you know before you get clearly into clinical sciences um, you don't get to talk about some of these diagnoses in this specific terms. You know, we were very keen on systolic, diastolic dysfunction. Even those are important things that we should know. It's just, it's just difficult um, when you use those terms to try to navigate the treatment because obviously the way that we're doing it at this level of internal medicine is primarily based on what is unique about the specific treatment, specific diagnosis, and all of that. Uh, moving into cardiomyopathies, we can group these ones under um, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. We can say non-ischemic 
all right? Uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, that's one category um, over there. We can then talk about also um, uh, a hypertrophic, all right, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, all right, and then uh, furthermore, we can talk about restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, so these are these are uh, main categories that we should definitely uh, be aware of. Okay. Oh, I think I took the space. Obviously, syncope um, here would just leave us a diagnosis, depending on the cause of it, whether it's a neurocardiogenic or you know an outright neurogenic syncope or uh, syncope that is primarily due to cardiac causes, which we'll be more focused on in this particular um, uh, series. Uh, we'll eventually go further on that. Uh, for arrhythmias, it's, it makes sense to say, you know, we have the Brady, Brady arrhythmias. We can, we can definitely just simply call bradycardia here. And obviously, we have the tachycardia. All right. Uh, bradycardia, which uh, you would want to... Let's say sinus node dysfunctions. All right, meaning basically the problem is primarily from the sinus sinus node activity, or you can then you know further d differentiate into heart blocks here, right? Heart blocks. Okay. Um, well, there's a sinus bradycardia or bradycardia that is. Um, um, uh, as a result of heart block, obviously with heart blocks we have further uh, categories: first degree, second degree, uh, third degree. Uh, we can also include some of the other types of heart blocks here, whether it's a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block. Um, obviously, these ones are even further tied into some other diagnoses. For example, left bundle branch block is almost an equivalent. Um, uh, for an acute ischemic event in certain cases. Pericardial diseases, we have to obviously uh, uh, write, uh, wrap our minds around the inflammatory pericardial diseases, um, particularly uh, pericarditis. Um, we can say acute pericarditis. Again, this is multifactorial. Um, so many things can cause the acute pericarditis, but another um, form of pericarditis could be a constrictive, constrictive pericarditis, uh, and somewhere these two guys can be primarily associated with some form of pericardial, pericardial effusion. All right, pericardial effusion and. Um, whether it's just simple pericardial effusion or we have, in certain cases, a cardiac tamponade. Um, we can just say maybe the pericardial effusion is what leads to the cardiac tamponade, even though we know the cardiac tamponade could also be, you know, maybe traumatic, right? It could be trauma-related or it could even be, in certain cases, you know, uh, cardiac wall rupture. There's so many reasons why cardiac tamponade may occur. All right. I just don't want to make the impression that it's primarily from pericardial uh, uh, fluid accumulation. Obviously, that is the 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 mechanism behind it. But that fluid could be blood from the heart. Uh, it could be, you know, the reason could be so many other things. Valvulopathies. It looks like I've kind of stifled the space for the valvulopathies. But if I could just put valvulopathies here. Valvulopathies here, we can definitely, you know, group them under. Um, how do we do this now? Um, we can say maybe we can say the AV valves, all right? You know, valvulopathies involving the AV valves or valvulopathies involving the semilunar valves. I'm sure, you know, we haven't used. Some of these terms are uh, from way back, but this is just the way that I like to remember them. Um, so whether it's, you know, the AV valves, we can definitely, you know, further say we have a mitral valvulopathies or uh, tricuspid. Um, when I say AV valves, I basically mean the um, atrioventricular valves. 
for the semilunar valves, we can see aortic valvulopathies or pulmonic. Um, the way that I also like to remember them um, is whether the murmurs, for example, the murmurs in certain cases are systolic and some of the murmurs are diastolic. I know these are all basic information, but it's, it's good to refresh ourselves, uh, our minds in these um, information. Um, so let's do it this way in a way that we can maybe able to group them, you know, maybe to group them under what would uh, be systolic or diastolic. So I'm going to put S there. I'm going to put a D here. So in terms of mitral, what mitral valvulopathy will give you a typical systolic murmur? We can say regurg here for mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation will give you a systolic murmur and mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis will give you uh, a diastolic murmur. You're talking about tricuspid. Um, obviously, um, the same will apply here. Tricuspid regurgitation would typically give you a systolic murmur. Uh, whereas, if there is, although it's very, very uncommon, if there is tricuspid stenosis, it will typically would give you uh, a diastolic murmur. Remember, I use this this lettering here to try to signify what does that. In terms of the aortic uh, valvulopathies, which of the aortic valvulopathies would give you a systolic murmur? Obviously, aortic stenosis, all right, would give aortic, uh, um, a systolic murmur. Again, you have to remember that if you go further, the, the type of murmur, what intensifies them, you know, what aggravates or reduces the intensities of the murmurs will also give you better information. But again, we're just going very basic here. Aortic stenosis gives you a systolic murmur, whereas the regurg, right, regurgitation in the aortic valve will give you a diastolic murmur. Um, same thing goes with the pulmonic uh, valves because the semilunar valves, pulmonic valve stenosis will give you a systolic murmur, whereas a pulmonic regurgitation will give you a diastolic murmur. Um, so that's one there. Okay, I thought I should have also come here, you know, just going back slightly now, I should come here to tachycardia. We were able to, you know, go a little bit further on uh, bradycardia's. Um, so let's let's just finish with the bradycardia maybe. Uh, second degree, remember we have morbid, all right? Type one and morbid type two. So basically I'm gonna go back one after the other to try to touch upon the things that I didn't further expand on. And then we'll um we'll uh, call it a day with this uh, particular mind map. Um so here we were to bring the tachycardias here. All right, um how do we, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to, to differentiate, but the way that I like to look at them would be in, okay, let's go based on a particular, we can say narrow complex tachycardias, all right? Um, so basically, when I am when I say narrow complex, we're just looking at the QRS morph morphology. If it's narrow complex, we that's a specific group of tachycardia, uh, and we can see here wide complex tachycardia. Um, but there are some of the tachycardias that don't necessarily fall under these uh, main categories, and sometimes they have you no know, abnormal presentation. So we can we can put these other types of tachycardias, for example, atrial fibrillation uh which is typically an irregular heartbeat um that will cause most of its damage uh with the tachycardia uh component of it um so we can also put another one here atrial flutter all right atrial flutter under the narrow complex tachycardia we have oh lord how do we even go with that Mm, you know what we, we could have we could have just done atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter on the narrow complex uh, in a way uh we can say what is regular what is irregular all right that helps significantly uh the most the most common type of irregular narrow complex tachycardia will be the av 
nodal re-entrant tachycardia. And then we also have the AV uh, re-entrant tachycardia. Uh, this is this re-entrant that is happening here is uh, based on just you know very straightforward re-entrant re mechanism. But the re-entrant that is happening here, this is the one where there is an accessory pathway, and this one when it goes into significant tachycardia is what we um, uh, refer to as the Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. And then we're still in regular, right? So we can also add here, we can also add here sinus, um, sinus tachycardia, all right? And we can further add here, we can say, you know, just regular um, atrial tachycardia. All of those guys are, are pretty regular. Um, Somewhere in the middle also we can add if atrial flutter here because that is also regular although it could it could present with a variable AV conduction that then becomes quite confusing. But again, let's keep it simple here. Let's keep it simple. I'm going to do something, guys. Uh, forgive me here. I'm going to remove atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter from here. And we'll just keep our differentiation based on narrow or um, wide complex tachycardia. So as, as we've seen so far, we've said, is the rhythm, is it a regular rhythm? Yes. What are the examples? AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia, uh, uh, AV uh, uh, re-entrant tachycardia in this case, which um, an example is the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. We also talked about sinus tachycardia and atrial tachycardia. All of these guys are regular, all right? They're all regular. Um, atrial flutter is also regular. Um, if we were to go further deep into, we talk about the, the sawtooth waves and all of that. But in irregular narrow complex tachycardia we can have here AFib all right the complex is narrow but in certain cases it could be wide um, which would be mean um, with AFib with aberrant conduction but we're not talking about that here we're just talking about AFib by itself and here we can also add multi um, MAT multifocal atrial tachycardia obviously as we go further into the the specific uh specifics of these diagnoses we'll talk about you know some of those features so just so we recap on what we've done so far we started with ischemic heart diseases we went to chronic stable angina which is a diagnosis on its own we went to acute coronary syndrome but i didn't further uh expansiate on that here we can talk about unstable angina all right uh we can talk here also about NSTEMI. all right which is no longer just angina, it means there's been an infarction. And here we can talk about STEMI, which is the big guy, which is you know, significant, significant damage here. So in acute coronary syndromes, unstable angina and STEMI and STEMI. Uh, with heart failure, we said we talked about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That is one diagnosis. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is another diagnosis. Cardiomyopathies, we talked about non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. That is a diagnosis in itself. Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is um, uh, usually uh, a diagnosis in itself. We can maybe specify a little here and say it's obstructive. So it's Hocum is the main diagnosis of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And finally, on the cardiomyopathy, we can talk about restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is the diagnosis uh, in and it's on itself, but it's, uh, it's a diagnosis in itself. Arrhythmias, we talk about bradycardia, we talk about sinus node dysfunctions, and then we talk about heart blocks, whether it's first degree, second degree, third degree, and in the second degree, we have Mobis type 1 and Mobis type 2. And we can add, we can throw in right on the branch, left on the branch block in there somewhere, even though those are part of other diagnoses. In certain cases, uh, LBBB could be representative of an acute uh, coronary event. Um, pericardial diseases, we talk about the inflammatory uh, diseases were whether it's acute pericarditis, which is a diagnosis in itself. Uh, we also talk about 
constrictive pericarditis, there's several types of it. There's constrictive effusive. There, there's several types of it, but, you know, just on the on the face of it, this is a diagnosis in itself, constrictive pericarditis. Pericardial effusion is another diagnosis, fluid around the heart. Could he advance into cardiac tamponade? Absolutely, yes. Is it just from the effusion? Could it be traumatic? Could it be from other reasons? Yes, but pericardial effusion would tend to tie some how with cardiac tamponade is tamponade is just the physiology that that means a significant uh uh compromise in cardiac activity congenital heart diseases now um okay we went into valvulopathies that we we talked about the av valvulopathies and the semi semi lunar valvulopathies we also further expanded on the tachycardias um Okay, yes. Yeah. So in congenital heart diseases now, um, there's several, several uh, types of them. Obviously, ASD is one, VSD is one. Um, some of these ones will have implications in the adult life. Uh, there's a bicuspid aortic valve uh, that could, you know, lead to other diagnoses such as the aortic stenosis itself. It could lead to aortic regurgitation. It also has some other associations with it. Um, it's important to uh, take note of those. Um, what else under congenital heart diseases we can talk about? Um, aortic coarctation. All right, so that's another diagnosis. Um uh, by itself, we also can talk about the, the PFOs or pitting Firmino Veil. That's another diagnosis. Uh, it's the type of the ASD, by the way. All right. All right. And then we have the other types of the ASD, whether it's Ostium Secundum, Ostium Primum, um, ASDs. Um, what else on the um, congenital heart diseases? I think that might be the main ones, you know. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, all right, I think that's fine. Um, under aortic diseases now, okay, there's a bunch here. In aortic diseases, um, we could uh, typically start with the the uh, aneurysms, all right? Aneurysms, aneurysms, um, aortic dissection, all right? It could be... It could be the dissection stemming from the aneurysm, or it could be just dissection primarily from hypertension, for example. Um, what else are we missing out here? So I'm going to switch back to the blue pen and put some of the categories here. Uh, infectious heart diseases is another one we didn't talk about. I'm going to put that here. Infectious heart diseases. And then finally, we can talk about peripheral peripheral heart disease. Okay, you know what? Let me just scratch it and come put it somewhere here. Uh, peripheral heart diseases. Okay. All right. Um, infectious heart diseases, we're typically talking about endocarditis. All right, endocarditis. There's several types of them. We'll go We'll go there when we go there. Uh, peripheral heart uh, diseases. Peripheral vascular disease, what I meant to say, Lord, Lord, help me. Peripheral vascular diseases, all right, or specifically peripheral arterial diseases, okay? These are some of the things we have to be able to talk about in cardiology as well. And uh, we could probably throw in tumors also, all right, where there's actual, actual tumors like the myxoma. Uh, in pediatric cases, probably the, the uh, rhabdomyomas, um, or in certain other adult cases like, you know, uh, fibroelastosis and stuff like that. So tumors, um, infectious heart diseases, peripheral heart diseases. We talked about the aortic diseases. Um, I think we might have touched on majority of the, you know, categories in, in cardiology we're supposed to know for internal medicine. Uh, so... Next, we'll be going to the specific diagnosis, whether we're talking about just, you know, the way the, 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 the diagnosis itself or the treatment uh, will go very specific in that case. And um, just just a note for all of the videos that we'll be will be 
doing here, there's three main questions, three main questions for each diagnosis, three main questions. We might add extra questions, but three main questions you have to ask yourself going in. You have to ask yourself for each diagnosis, how does it present? That's the first thing. How does it present? If you don't know, if you don't recognize how it presents, you're not going anywhere with the diagnosis. And again, if you're looking at vignettes, that's typically how the, the build up is they give you a presentation and then you're supposed to figure it out from there. Next thing, how do you test for that disease? If you have a sense of how it presents, how do you test to make sure you're looking at the right disease? The third thing is how do you treat? Just re revolve your mind around these essentials. How does it present? How do you test for it? How do you treat it? Some of the uh, things you might throw in there with how does it present is also risk factors because in the vignettes you may be asked about it may, you may be told about risk factors that helps you then recognize the particular disease so we could make that four now all right so we can say how does it present all right how does it present what are the risk factors for the disease so if that's in the vignette you know um how do you test for the disease to know you're treating the right thing and finally how or uh, how do you treat that disease? And that's it for now. I'll see you next time.